you've all been availed of why we're doing this, this round table to discuss uh, social justice, specifically racial justice, as it pertains to the New York Mets, as it pertains to you, not only as former players for the Mets organization, but just as human beings who have walked the earth. So Cleon, sir, I'd like to start with you if possible. You really grew up at a very pivotal time in our nation's history during the civil rights era. I grew up in, in a kind of an isolated community called Africa Town. If you know anything about Africa Town, you know that the last slave ship, potential slave ship, sailed to this part of the country, chained and shackled and brought to America against their, their will. Those uh, enslaved people made home. When I grew up in this area, it was about 12,000 people, a community of color. My father left here because he got into it with a white gentleman because he snatched my mother out of the bus line saying that she shouldn't have been in front of another white woman. That, that was the only racial injustice that, that, that I remember until I got to be a teenager. Uh, that's when I started to try to play a athletics and I got blindsided by all of the hostility that, that was bestowed upon me. I always relied on the three J's, Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens and Jackie Robinson. Those are the people that inspired me and, and put me on the right track to become a professional. It's interesting, Cleon, when you said that the three J's, all of you mm -hmm. in this round table nodded your head. And Ron, clearly three very important people in baseball. What were you thinking? It's, it's, it's interesting to me because two of those Jays came to spring training and, and that I met them through the New York Mets. I met Jackie Robinson at a Met old timer game. As a matter of fact, if you look at this photo, this is a photo when Jackie was still in pretty good shape and uh, it was a Met old timer day and, and I took a, a photograph with him and I always thought if you cared about human beings and had any empathy in your heart, you had to appreciate the difficulty for an excellent player and an intelligent guy, officer in, in the armed forces who became the first African-American baseball player. And I was a kid that grew up in a segregated community. There was a small enclave of uh, African-Americans um, that, that I more or less went by on the way to my elementary school when I rode my bike as a kid. And um, one time, two white guys came upon me as I was coming home and um, they were gonna slap me around. And two, two black guys came out of this community, people I didn't know, and scared those white guys off of me. Otherwise, I was gonna get my butt kicked. That was an incident that, you know, I mean, you can't forget those kind of things when you're a kid growing up. Daryl, I wonder what your experience was growing up, going from Crenshaw to Kingsport, Jackson, Flushing. <laughs> Growing up and, and where I came from was a, a complete different time, of course, uh, than it was in the 60s and, and 70s. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s and coming out of high school and growing up in South Central Los Angeles. Being African-American and you grow up in those neighborhoods, uh, one thing you really do is you just know your neighborhood. Um, I wasn't a guy that I had any negative feelings towards any uh, color of people. Uh, I think I learned that as I was going through high school and I started playing ball and you started playing in competition and you started playing against, you know, white players and stuff like that because we really didn't play against a lot of them in summer ball, only in high school. I, I could tell you as I went uh, alone to play Major League Baseball coming through the minor leagues, there were some challenges. You know, there were some real challenges because at Crenshaw High, you're all black school and nobody calls you boy and nobody calls you out of your name when you're on the baseball field. And when I played in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, that's pretty much what I, what I was hearing every night. You know, the N-words was telling me to sit down and, and calling me a boy. And I just remember, you know, running back to the dugout, my coach, Gene Dusan, just kept telling me, don't look up there. You know, mm -hmm. because I was just a kid and I almost came close to quitting baseball. And, and, and I told the organization that, that I, I just couldn't take, you know, what was coming from fans and what was coming from people. I had to really... Um, build some new character about myself, you know, through that whole process. And, you know, with the help of, of players like Lloyd McClendon, I had people to help me. 
And you have to give people credit that was in your life that really helped you uh, walk through that process when you were going along those roads and had to deal with so many different things. Okay, I wonder, as you listen to Daryl, do any of the anecdotes that he tells, do they resonate with you? And if so, how? Yeah, I remember uh, one weekend, uh, my brother and I, we um, probably gave the car we went to the, to the movie. On the way back, we decided we were going to stop in at the little diner. Well, we stopped at the diner, went in, sat to the, to the counter, and we were there probably 45 minutes. <laughs> no one came <laughs> and asked if we wanted anything to eat or anything. We ended up leaving, by the way, uh, but they wouldn't, they didn't serve us. And I, I think that's the first time that I experienced racism. That time, we didn't consider it being racist, although that's what it was. We just knew, hey, that was pretty much a norm for where we were. Edgardo, what was your experience like? Um, coming into the majors or even, you know, just your experience before coming to play baseball as a, as a Latino. First time coming out of my, my country, we never have that issue in, in, in where I live, where I come from in Venezuela, because we don't, I mean, to me, uh, to us in there, we don't, we don't see what color skin you have. It was pretty much, you know, we, we treat like monkey everywhere equal, you know. 1991, when I my first coming to, uh, to the States, it was really, uh, really hard for me in the beginning. I have to, to, to get used to, uh, you know, the culture, the speak the same language. I don't even know about, about <clears throat> if you are uh, different color, how they're going to, pe the people, how they're going to take you or how you're going to act around. I don't even know nothing because remember, I come to play baseball. I don't even know if it's you are you are black or, or white or Spanish. You don't know why this this group in this in this side and the other group is in that side and the, the Latin group is in one side. It was it was it was really hard. Cleon, um, I'm sure you heard what Daryl was talking about when he was playing in Virginia and racial epithets uh, being being used towards him. How similar or different was your experience? One situation in North Carolina, uh, where a guy <clears throat> hollered down at me, uh, at me at the stand, if you, if you hit that ball, say, I'm gonna come down there and see about you. And uh, I, I hadn't looked up at him, and then I stepped out of the box then, and I looked up at him, and I dug a hole down to my ankle. I said, I'm gonna hit this ball as hard as you can hit a ball. And I hit a bullet off the wall. And when I came home uh, on a sack fly, he was standing behind the uh, dugout. He said, by God, boy, you're gonna be a good one. And I thought he was gonna uh, do one of those numbers, call me some names and and, and, and beloved me and whatnot, I, I think I want a friend by, by, by responding to what he was saying. And that, that happened to me throughout my career. I remember an incident where we were in, uh, uh, I was in AAA at Buffalo. Uh, Elio Chacon was on that team, uh, one of your countrymen. They got a, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a shortstop. We were told, stay together. When you go to eat, when you go out, stay together. And uh, Elio uh, must have got hungry, and uh, so he went downstairs, and and, and uh, the civil, civil right act had just passed. So he came back upstairs, and uh, man, he was in tears, and he he was he was just upset. So we all got together, and went back down to that same restaurant, and and uh, uh, sat down and and uh, to order. The owner of the restaurant came in and uh, said. We don't serve niggas in here. And uh, I said, I don't eat niggas. And uh, <laughs> so he said, uh, well, you, 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 uh, uh, you guys can't be in. So he said, I'm going to call uh, the police. He called the police. And the police came and said, well, they have every right to be in here. You got to serve them. Well, I had made up my mind at uh, that time. Uh, I wasn't about to eat anyway. But, but it was one of those situations where uh, uh, we ordered food, and we got served, and, and we left. But then when, 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 when you leave and, and, and you go to the next town, and you're the lead team, and you got to do the same thing in Jacksonville, you got to do the same thing in, in, in Richmond, 
you, you say to yourself, how in the hell am I going to play ball when I got to do all this work uh, just to eat, uh, just, just to, to, to help uh, move the situation along? And I realize now all the time, the sit-ins that we did, that, that uh, it, it was all worth it.